Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. We're between three to six inches of snow, so pretty good dose of snow in Winter Park. Look at this beautiful shot this afternoon. You can wow! Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's so it's gonna be kind of cold today. Temps in the thirties. Bye. It's break break. Episode 122, I'm weatherman Tom Merritt. Hey, and I'm your news anchor, Brian Brushwood, in for the vacationing Tom Merritt, who's taking a vacation and being a weatherman. That was hilarious. So, <laughs> television I, I don't news know. studios of the world, when you cut staff too far, there's no one to pick up the camera when it falls over, <laughs> and the weather lady has to crawl out of her segment. I'll tell you what, man, she did not miss a beat. The moment oh, that the moment she starts immediately tap dancing and gets down on all fours, like that girl deserves a raise instantly. Absolutely. I hope she did uh, get one. Uh, that, that was pretty hilarious. You know, Brian, it's just you and I today. It's like old times. It feels good, don't you think? It's kind of weird. I feel like there's a big old fat vacuum that we have to fill with our opinions about what it means to cut the cord and watch what you want when you want. Also, a lot of room for us to grouse about the current state of the cable business. You know what we need? We need something big to fill that gap. This just in, the big story. Ladies and gentlemen, Dude. Amazon getting into the set-top box game. Are you excited, Brian? Uh, you know what's awesome about this story is that virtually every article that we read kind of like the first one, the first one was like, why? And then the other one was like, Here's why, <laughs> with the head tilt <laughs> to the side. I mean, this is one of those things that totally makes sense from Amazon's point of view. But from the consumer's point of view, I mean, are you are you remotely excited about another plastic chunk of nothing to throw on top of your television? Yes, and let me tell you why, Brian. Uh, okay, so we don't really know anything, but sources are telling Bloomberg Businessweek, uh, which actually has a fairly decent record when it comes to these sort of stories, so it's probably true that Amazon's going to put out a set-top box. They could totally screw it up. It could be another also ran. It could be like, it only runs Amazon Instant Prime and Amazon Instant On Demand, and then it would suck. But what I want is as many people trying this as possible because the more people that are trying, the better chance we get that somebody feels the pressure and comes up with something good. Okay, now try this on for size. As long as right. we're speculating wildly here, what if, what if, what if they were able to reach out? Think about how many people are Amazon Prime members that don't even know that they get a instant streaming service with Amazon Prime. And then... You know, people who never would consider buying a Roku or buying a dedicated box, if their end game is just to get more people using the service to keep everything in house, because that's the justification to create your own box, is there's a lot of overlap between the Amazon library and the Netflix library. And if you're able to use this box to push people to the Amazon side of things, that, of course, is better for Amazon, both for their branding and for, you know, the use of their, their product. What if we started to see a subsidized kind of like essentially free? What if they're able to build a box for 40 bucks and they figure out like, wow, if we get people using this and out there, like maybe not just ship it out to everyone instantly, but make it the kind of thing where you opt in or spend $200 and you get an automatic Amazon now, streaming box for free. People in the chat room are saying sign up for two years of prime service, get the box for free, that kind of thing. There you go. Now, I, I could totally see that being a winning move, both for them and weirdly even for consumers, because you're reaching, you're targeting the kind of people who never would get a streaming box otherwise. But here's the thing. It has to do other competing services. And then I think Amazon wipes the floor with people temporarily. But it also has to have the interface that allows you to use it easily if it wants to win in the long run. Amazon looks at this as a loss leader, I'm sure. The question sure. is, is it going to be the Kindle Fire where they say, 
we have an app store and you can put anything on here, but we're not going to let the Nook app in, right? Or right. is it going to be like Kindle where they say, you know what? We're making this thing for anybody. Anybody can use no, there's, it. There's no way. Know? I, I don't think it will be because it makes no sense. There's no benefit to them. The only thing that this – that the only reason for this to exist is to reach out to a market that not, wouldn't otherwise be in there. And keep in mind, the Kindle, part of the reason they could be hands-off is because they were pioneering a new marketplace. They're not pioneering the this new fire. marketplace. I'm not this talking is about old. the Kindle. The Kindle Fire. Right, right. Okay, but but my, my point is is well, for them to do it smart, and I mean this universally and, and without uh, snark – like for them to do it smart, it's got to be tightly contained, tightly curated, and it's got to be smaller in focus. They can't possibly enter the marketplace with some kind of wide open-ended Google TV-like promise or what we're hearing about from this Intel box. What they need to do is say, you like Amazon Prime. Now, all, you don't have to just watch on your Kindle fi Fire on a small screen. You can watch on the big screen your Amazon content, period. I think that's how they lose, frankly. I, d I disagree with you. I think if that's what they do, they probably get rid of a few of them as a novelty, but people start realizing, oh, well, I like Netflix. I can't get Netflix on this thing. Oh, I like Hulu. But the show I want to watch is only on Hulu. I can't get... What you have to do if you want to dominate is be able to provide the service that gives you all of the things you want to watch. And now, if you want to win, you have to be the service that makes it easy to just type in, I want to watch this and I don't care what subscription I have to be subscribed to. I just want to watch it. Now, I do think that they will have Hulu and Netflix on there, but I think okay, that what, right. what will happen is you will search for terms and it'll make sure to put Amazon, you know, listed prominently first so that you're using that service. They wouldn't have a wide open app store like the, like, uh, like an Android box or something. Right, correct. Or or Google TV. Like, we're not going to play Angry Birds on this thing. This thing, gotcha. I mean... No, I, I think know, you're maybe, right about that. I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, I don't know. Like, I went, I went to both sides. Like, as a consumer, I heard this. I'm like, this is dumb. Who cares? But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, they've got it. They, they've got to do this. And because they're not in a position of Netflix. Netflix is in a position of massive market dominance on streaming content. Their whole motto is any screen, we can get it on there. Um, that's I just described a motto to, to, to Netflix, uh, but, uh, and, and that's not the position that Amazon's in. Amazon needs to basically their message needs to be, Hey, we're here too. And I think giving cheap subsidized boxes might be a good way to outreach and get, and get those, those, uh, customers who don't perceive themselves as being streaming kind of people. Yeah, I think Amazon sees it as making the money off of selling the stuff because that's what they do. They're retail, right? So yep. I, I see them making this extraordinarily cheap or maybe free with a deal possibly, but probably just really cheap, like 50 bucks. And it comes with Amazon Prime. It has Netflix. It has Hulu. Maybe it even has YouTube. I don't know if they can strike that deal. And they have an app store on there because they already do the Amazon app store. So it's easy enough to implement that. But you have to have your app coded for the box for it to get into that app store. So right. they have a little bit of a gate control on that. But it makes it easier for, say, the CW or ABC or somebody to get their apps in there and, and create a, a, a greater breadth to Amazon's offering. That seems to fit with the way that Amazon does business, seems to fit with what they have already done with the Kindle Fire that they can then translate. Uh, and it seems to fit with the strategy that helps them get a leg up. In the end, though, if that's what it is, I don't know if that ends up winning, again, unless unless it has a really powerful way to find the stuff you want to watch. Well, here's the question. Like, if they're very likely very good at doing market research and finding out who their current audience is with Prime. And Prime is an unusual product in that a lot of people buy it for one thing, and that's so that they can get their stuff shipped to them faster and cheaper because they like being part of the Amazon ecosystem. It could be that they're sitting there looking. They're like, okay, we know that streaming is going to get huge. We know that only, what, 15, 20% of people go to streaming as their first option for content, which means we got 80% of the populace that needs to be introduced to this idea and be seduced. We are sitting on a massive, massive client base with a massive amount of people who uh, haven't been converted yet. We could be the missionaries and grow this from within. Uh, you know, and again, that's that's this is all wild speculation. I have no idea what they do and don't know. But I, if that list is big enough, and they perceive that they could be the ones to bring to essentially proselytize to these folks and say, no, 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 it's pretty rad. You just you know you don't need channels anymore. Then uh, then you know it might make sense for them to do it. But the key, the key to all of this 
is that I, as a consumer, even if you put it in my hands for free, I have to be able to watch the things I want to watch or it, or it just ends up going in a closet. Yeah, I, and I think I think we're getting closer to those days. I mean, it's it's all of a sudden it's not a matter of whether you're going to have a streaming strategy for whatever content you own. It's a matter of what your strategy will be and w whether it makes sense to go exclusive with an HBO Go kind of situation. Or mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I, I I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like that problem is just going to get smaller over time, and as, especially as you start to, I I don't know. I, I guess I'm really asking about. Uh, about exclusivity as a concept, but now that I'm saying it, it sounds stupid. Of course, there'll always be exclusivity, and it's always going to be a battle. There'll be exclusivity, but the platform is not going to be able to handle it. You're not going to be able to have ex exclusivity on the hardware, or I just don't think that works. You can have exclusivity, well, I, I, and Netflix, let's actually, that takes us right into another big story. Let's, let's go right there. You went there. Stop everything. Dive through this this is another big story. Take a right, right there by the river, and then here we are. Another big story. <laughs> Netflix, <laughs> after its earnings call, posted an 11-page manifesto for its investors to lay out its strategy. One of the things it said in there was that they are going to focus on quality television. Uh, they said they're not interested in things like The Daily Show that expire. They're not interested in reality shows. They're not interested in sports. Those are all great things for other platforms. And they don't have a problem with them. But they are going to focus on movies and entertainment. Uh, and one of the quotes is, we have to be a focused passion brand. Starbucks, not 7-Eleven. Southwest yes. Airlines, not United. HBO, not Dish. I don't know if those are the best examples. I get the Starbucks 7-Eleven one. The other one's kind of kind of weird. But oh, dear, are you kidding me? Like, I'm, I'm a very really passionate good. Southwest Airlines <laughs> fan. I, I, I'm a huge Southwest Airlines plan, yeah, fan. But, it makes perfect sense. But the, but South, I guess Southwest focuses on things, but it's not the, the best translation of we're going to focus on these elements and not try to be everything. Starbucks to 7-Eleven seems to be the best example to me, which is Starbucks says, yeah, we have coffee. And then we have snacks that go along with how awesome coffee is. But we don't try to be everything. We don't give you eggs. We don't let you what, buy what, milk. That's 7-Eleven. You are, you are selling a lifestyle with, uh, with Starbucks, right? It's like it's, if I say Starbucks customer, there is a specific experience and type of person that you picture instantly. You know, someone sitting there with his Apple MacBook writing his screenplay, eating his bagel croissants or whatever they have there listening to his npr curated library whatever they're selling a lifestyle um i was just going to keep on going with that for a long time but i realized i shouldn't since i'm probably half that guy uh but the important <laughs> thing is that <laughs> netflix beard, also right realized i know <laughs> they all they realize that they're selling a lifestyle as being somebody who's technically savvy who uh who who you know Again, like basically the frame rate audience. If you're listening to this show, if you even know what we're talking about when we say cutting the cord, if you know what the phrase cutting the cord means, then you are the person that Netflix is reaching out to. I think this is a very smart strategy for them to have a statement uh, clarifying their position and uh, setting up massive long-term goals, which is, which is great. Uh, they acknowledge stuff like, uh, you know, big problem is that our incomplete library. That's why they're spending, did I read this right? $2 billion in licensing fees that's in a year? What they expect, yeah, that's what they expect to spend this year. That is and, phenomenal. And, 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 and what they're saying too is, sure, we're going to go to Viacom and strike a deal, but we're not going to renew the deal we had because Viacom was making us buy everything. And we're not going to buy The Daily Show anymore because that doesn't work for us. We don't yeah. want content that expires. We want high quality, durable content. So you're right about the lifestyle being a big part of it. But I think the other thing is them saying, we're going to focus the kinds of content you get from Netflix so that it doesn't, you're not catching up on yesterday's news. You're right. enjoying yourself. You're finding great things to watch that are timeless, whether they're from the 70s or whether they're from now. We're going right. to be more selective about what we watch. And he he put HBO in his sights and said, you know, we have more subscribers this year than HBO, and that, and we're probably going to double or triple their subscribership, but it will be years before we rival them in quality of content. But by well, saying that, is, he was basically saying, and then we will, and we will crush them. Yes, well, and 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 I think that I think that's what I really dug about everything I read about this statement is that it was very honest, very direct. I felt like like this is the kind of thing that Reed Hastings would say if you were having a cup of coffee coffee at Starbucks with him. Uh, let me say this: as far as the expiring content. Uh, this is my one shot uh, to the world 
that uh, if you guys have not watched Avatar The Last Airbender uh, seasons one, two, and three, like that's set to expire. I assume that's part of the, the Viacom content situation because Nickelodeon is a Viacom company, right? I believe you're right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So as part of that, that's about to go away. So you still have time. Right now is a great time to jump in. It is, yes, it's intended for kids, but it is in my heart one of the best narrative television experiences I've ever had from beginning to end. Um, it's, it's, but it may stick awesome around. They, 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 they say they want to still strike a deal, and it might be part of that. We just don't know. Right, correct. But I know for right now it's set to expire and that you only have a few weeks left left to watch it. Uh, I'll tell you what, man. In general, I think Netflix is doing everything exactly right. I'll tell you what, man. How crazy is it that just one year ago we were making Netflix the butt of all our jokes with its uh, quickster announcements and its tanking stocks and its its schizophrenic way of, of handling its own business model. Just and now even implying that maybe Netflix wasn't going out of business in the next year. People were I, people in the chat room were just taking pot shots out at me. At me a year yeah, ago. I remember yeah, that. Sure. Like, I was just trying to be balanced, and they're like, "Ah, yeah, it's because they're an advertiser. You suck. Netflix is going down. We hate that. They raise the price." Here, here they are, stronger than ever a year later. Yeah, well, and and with a clarity of purpose and a clarity of vision that is very well stated in this document. Uh, it's 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 not only you know. Regardless of if you've ever had a bad experience with Netflix, it's clear that they are the the vanguard leading the the cord cutting revolution. They have a a vested interest not only in you know providing their content and the you know and making lucrative deals, but but if cord cutting catches on as a global trend, then then they win, we win, everyone wins. All right, uh, let's. Well, 4K streaming will proliferate long before linear TV makes the shift. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, we. as a matter of fact, there was a story somebody sent to me, and I didn't put it in the doc because it was just about piracy. But apparently there's a, there's a Torrent Freak um, article that talks about the proliferation of 60 uh, of high frame rate uh, publications that are making the rounds on BitTorrent. Now, keep in mind, uh, HFR... Cannot it is not supported by Blu-ray. Blu-ray can't do HFR content, but there's all kinds of sporting events that are broadcast in, in 60 frames per second. I assume a lot of content gets upsampled to uh, 60 frames a second, like Avatar and so on. Um, the only way this content can ever be distributed at, with the current infrastructure is over illegal bit torrenting. And so weirdly, the last place you would expect to see a flight to quality has been in the in the piracy circles because uh, because there's no other way to do it, and I think that 4K is going to be the exact same thing. I think we're going to see 4K, uh, you know, up samples, upscaled uh, content in a higher quality. Unfortunately, in the black hole of piracy, dismisses cord cutting as not an issue. Says services like Netflix, MLB TV, and iTunes are currently a material strategic problem for companies that are both an ISP. And an MPVD, meaning multi-platform video device, basically saying, come on, ISPs, just bundle us in with your service. We're not a problem. We're not a threat at all. So uh, let, I'm going to do this. I, I, I'm going to hold off on saying it, but I will explain when we get to the appropriate story why, weirdly, I think we're not going to give up our cable services. We're not going to cut the cord, and we'll be okay with it. We'll be happy. I think there's something around I think I think you've buried what I think could be the biggest of all the stories. And we'll see, we'll, we'll Maybe see when the we biggest get the story is yet to come. But first, we have to thank no one. We have to thank you. The, you don't have listener. an advertiser. No, no, we, you we know, can thank the listeners. You think so? Even if you, you know don't what? have an advertiser, I, Brian, I'll tell you what. I think all that should mean is that you, the audience, need to tell even more people to keep watching until the advertisers can't ignore us. They just I'll say there's what. so many people watching Frame Rate. We have to be there. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, I'll tell you one person we can thank right away is our friends over at Doghouse Systems who hooked me up with the streaming PC that made possible this entire studio. Every time you ever see me in this space and it's just getting better and better, now I'm able to stream in 720p uh, HD and that's entirely because of our friends at uh, Doghouse Systems. They set me up with a code SHWOOD, S-H-W-O-O-D. You get a whole, like, like $100 plus of loot from me plus free art if you do it, but uh, they make good PCs. Small company right here in uh, Texas. Did you just sneak an ad in? I totally did. Is it, look, hey, bro, if there ain't going to be no ads, I'm just going to thank somebody. Just I, I thank people. Yeah. That's right. what I do. I thank people. <laughs> Let's move on to the slipstream.
Yahoo snags the exclusive rights to Saturday Night Live's archives. That doesn't mean full episodes. It means clips. But they have the exclusive right to show clips from old episodes, although full old episodes may be shown elsewhere. See, this is weird because I... I can't decide if this is a good get or a bad get because I guess full episodes are still available elsewhere. It's not as exclusive as they make it sound. But if I'm going to experience old episodes, part of me says I would want to experience it as like time traveling into the past and get the whole episode. But another part of me says, I don't want to watch no full episode of Saturday Night Live. I just want to half remember the Chop and Broccoli skit for, with Dana Carvey. Let me go back and look at that. And uh, so in that, in that regard, maybe that's brilliant. In fact, yeah. I think I've decided. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. It's funny. I, I think this is brilliant for Yahoo. Because yes. what if Yahoo wants to become a place where people think, I want to watch video, then they need to build relationships with the broadcasters. And one way to do that is a deal like this. It's exactly what Netflix did. Netflix is at that turning point where they're like, look, for years we've just been taking whatever you would possibly sell us. Now we're big enough. We're dominant enough. We can be selective. Yahoo's not at that place. Yahoo has to say, Sure, we'll we'll take all of the old Saturday Night Live clips. That's great. Yeah, we we know we won't get full episodes all the time exclusively. That's fine. We'll, let's let's start a relationship. Let's build this. So I think it's now brilliant think about for Yahoo this. in that respect. Here's here's what they're going to. It, it, I would love it if they set this up because by its, by itself, I don't know that I'm ever going to care or go. I may search out a, a SNL. Oh, you know what? Actually, there's one reason this may be awesome is because for years, how many years? Have I answered Skype saying, this is Mrs. Devereaux? And right. I cannot find that skit. It's, it was the huh. mimic. It was, it was Alec Baldwin with, uh, Although, with Paul McCartney. This library was supposedly it, available in, on Hulu. So if, it's not, if it wasn't available there, is it going to be available on Yahoo? I don't know. But I do know that sooner or later, I'll finally get to play the mimic <laughs> for, for people. But uh, here, here's what I would love to see. If Yahoo wants to build on it, what they could do is create kind of a software customized curated experience where you can go by decade or by year or by actor or and and have people upvote and downvote. You have this incredible library that everybody feels some attachment to one piece of this mosaic of all the SNL sketches, this uh, you know, this uh, uh, gestalt of 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 uh, our our cultural identity at th over 30 years, right? Why not create something that lets people vote up and vote down and create playlists to take you through all these memories? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of cool things they could do with this, even though they're only pieces of this jigsaw puzzle. We talked about Twitter doing a comedy fest with Viacom uh, and, and a few others uh, last week, I think it was. YouTube is going to have its own comedy week as well, starting May 19th through May 25th. Uh, you can you can watch all kinds of people like Vince Vaughn, Rain Wilson, Sarah Silverman, Seth Rogen, The Onion, College Humor, Epic Meal Time, Funny or Die. They're all going to be taking part in a week of highlighting stuff to watch that's funny on YouTube. Now, full disclosure, as I always say with these YouTube stories, uh, my wife works for YouTube, and usually I say, but I don't know anything about this. But this time, I actually do know stuff about this because she's working on this. Awesome, uh, but but you ain't gonna say it. I see how you roll. Uh, what is it? What's up with the what's up with the comedy wars? And, and first of all, okay, look, I understand Twitter doing a Vine related comedy festival because Twitter is perceived as you know where are you to go to find out when celebrities died as soon as possible. And so, like, yes, let's let's make the seven second comedy festival a thing. That's I, I get all that. YouTube. Pretty, pretty tightly branded with comedy in mind. I, I didn't know that this is the kind of thing they needed to fix from a branding or imaging perspective. I, I don't think they're trying to fix anything with it. I think they're trying to highlight it. They're saying, hey, we know that we have a lot of really good stuff on here, like the Fine Brothers, for instance, and, and we have uh, uh, Ratchet and Clank. Uh, you know, we've, we've got all kinds of great people doing stuff. So let's let's celebrate that. Let's let's put that up over the top. Because that, that's what YouTube's whole deal with these creator spaces is, is taking what's already happening on YouTube and trying to make it better. So as somebody said, uh, is this uh, Shark Week? It was Beatmaster. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what this is. It's not that yeah. Discovery is trying to improve their image around nature programming when they do Shark Week. It's a promo to get everybody's eyes on them, like a sweep sweep kind of thing. And I think what? that's what YouTube's doing here.
Here's the thing that I like the most about this is the talk about there being a a single live experience. And this is something I fully expect YouTube to get into more. We've seen that YouTube has taken a slow journey into live, that they're very careful because you uh, there, there are certain uh, content IDs. And of course, YouTube is trying to be good about piracy. So they've they've slowly rolled out the live experience. Uh, and, and a lot of that live experience has been curated so that they know that they're trusted content providers who know the rules about doing live stuff. But one thing that Twit has had full on over YouTube has been this unified live experience. 24 hours a day, there's always somebody in the chat room and there's always content, even if it's reruns being played. And when you come to twit.tv, live.twit.tv, you feel like you've entered a physical space where there's there's a party going on. There's times it's quieter at three in the morning, but people are still chatting amongst themselves. There's other times it's a raucous party, you know, once a week with uh, with This Week in Tech, of course, where we sometimes it's two full chat rooms. Uh, I have been shocked that nobody else has really filled that experience on on the YouTube side of things and the fact that they're creating an event and uh, hopefully well YouTube, the chat YouTube doesn't doesn't allow that they don't they they, they have a, a very different approach to live they 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 have a weird channel uh, definition and in fact when you go to a channel there was a great video that I saw over the weekend explaining what the problem is when you like a show that's on say the nerdist or geek and sundry it's hard to find that show because the channels yes are meant to subscribe to channels. So I think YouTube just has a navigation and discovery problem and, and live there. It's not possible to set up a 24 seven live channel over there. Correct. Well, what I'm hoping is, is that little moments like this, the fact that they're at least setting up a single experience that people are supposed to go and, and do together live at the same time. Uh, I just want to see two things. I want to see the chat room fix because their, their, their live commenting feature just sucks. It's terrible. It's awful. And it's and there's the it's it it's delayed. I mean, you would think that they would be able to do just some kind of IRC to fix it, but apparently they can't. Um, but uh, and and the second thing is, I would love to see this normalize the idea that in some way, because that is here's the weird part, Tom. I kind of miss the experience from the '80s of broadcast television and just knowing. But YouTube that doesn't do that. That's all I'm saying. That's watching, you stream. That's Justin TV. That's that's YouTube just hasn't got into that. You're just. It sounds to me you're just saying like I wish YouTube would do that. Well, well, I mean, it looks like they're they're trying to. I mean, you, you know, they have taken very slow steps towards doing that, and I think that there's a need for people to do that. We certainly on YouTube Live, uh, the whole. Internet was electrified when we watched that dude jump out a balloon from yeah, space. Yeah, Brian, it's almost yeah. like they decided to hire a production strategist with S Silicon Valley experience and have her move down from San Francisco and drag her <laughs> husband with her to become the live producer there. Did I did I just tease out an exclusive announcement? Is that what no, just happened? That's what that's what they hired her for. They hired her for live. That wasn't a secret. <laughs> well, no, I I know, but but I uh, I am very excited. All I'm trying to say is I'm excited. For more live, I'm ex I'm excited to see them place an emphasis on live. I think that is a vastly underserved element of the YouTube experience, and uh, and I'm glad to see this. Is all I'm trying to say. You're you're also, making it sound like this is all about live this week, and I'm not certain it is. Although my wife might disagree with me, I don't know. Uh, I, I that's the only part I care about. Like as a consumer, I care about the live experience. I want I something electric. I need more electricity. Uh, YouTube also adding MLB content full games now you don't get highlights until two days after a game is over so you're not going to get live stuff you're not going to get even like yesterday's game but you are going to get highlights of games two days after the air and you're going to get a big catalog of old games going back even into the 50s uh tom i love you but you're infected with the likes baseball disease uh explain to me why i would ever want to watch an this is, entire this is not about you and it's not about me this is about a channel getting access to sports content for the cord cutter. Yes. Okay. This hypothetical guy, just just, just explain to me why this guy would want to watch a, a three-week-old game. Do you know why ESPN Classic was created and succeeded? That's all you had to say, bro. That's, a, that's you it. Go. You're right. You You're go. right. It's a time machine. You go back and you, you relive those amazing moments. You're, that's, I'm, I'm down. Totally cool. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the New York Times, which I was kind of kvetching about before the show because someone was sending me a New York Times link to explain something. And I'm like, yep. I can't read this because I've reached my 10 article limit this month. Uh, and I don't feel like doing the work around to try to get around it. And I will do that. I will just stop reading the New York Times, frankly. I 
don't want to pay for it for the little bit that I use it. I will find those resources elsewhere. Reuters, Ooh, Bloomberg. Oh, you hear that, New York Times? You just got called out. You just got served by Tom Merritt. Headline, Tom but, the New York Times. Eat an 11th article. On, they announced on Tuesday that they will no longer count video views as part of that 10 article limit because they want to build up a bigger video presence and they want people to watch their videos. Apparently, they don't want people to read their stories. They just want people to watch their videos. I don't how know. Much of this, how much of this do you think, Tom, is people painting themselves in a corner? Like there's certain things they have to say early, but as the entire landscape shifts and they realize that their position is inherently damaging to an entire wing of their organization, how much of this is like, well, let's just decide that these rules are different because it's this category. And then that way yeah, we'll eventually. We could, we could go down the rat hole talking about paywalls and subscriptions. And, and honestly, in all seriousness, I think the New York Times has managed the paywall waters quite well, uh, better than 90% of the other print publications that have tried this sort of thing. But I think it is very interesting when they're like, oh, but we really want to build up an audience in video. So we'll drop the paywall for that. Right. I guess their argument is our print already has a reputation that's worth paying for. And so you have to drop that paywall to build an audience. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. But also newspapers getting into video is the wave of the future, don't you think? Oh, dude, absolutely. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, it's it's so weird seeing a mushy middle in a transition phase right now where nobody knows what to say and people say stuff that they feel like they have to back up later and they're all stuck in there. Uh, regardless, it's like, I'm just very excited to see quality journalism coming to new mediums and in a faster medium that we're seeing here. And we're starting to see a whole new set of journalistic rules. Like, how do you handle a story when everyone's talking about something on Twitter, but it's unverified and that's the rumor. It's like, you know, what's what's appropriate for vetting that out, but also being first to, to, to get it out. And we're seeing the merging, right? This is the mergining. New York Times says, no, we really actually want to be a professional broadcaster. That's what, that's what yeah. this means. Uh, and that's new for them. So it'll, it'll be interesting to watch them build this up because what they're saying in this release is we are committed to increasing the output and quality of our video. And I, I think they will. And I think they're going to have to bring in some new blood to do that. But I think, we, I think we'll see another national news broadcaster created on the Internet, granted from a very old property. But sure, sure. That's one thing that people are wanting off the Internet as well is, is good news programming. And it's hard to find. Well, and of course, you know, it takes an, an inefficient model like the old newspaper model in order to have massive amount of resources to spend, you know, thoroughly researching a story in order to get it all vetted and figured out. And then, you know, of those stories that get written for whatever reason, you throw a bunch of them out and that's just a sunk cost of $50,000 and a half a year for someone. Uh, it, it takes some of that big media money in order to get a quality of, of storytelling. Uh, and it is storytelling. It's like no, everyone whatever journalism news it's all reality television as far as i'm concerned but for a depth of storytelling that it takes in order to resonate with the whole country i, I think it's good that we're getting old media involved uh, a couple of minor things in the slipstream before we move on uh direct tv adding voice search to its smartphone ding, app ding, ding 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 this is my big story this is tom sorry to interrupt but uh yeah you don't you don't think you you look highly skeptical you look highly skeptical i Okay. Please, please enlighten me. So here's the thing. DirecTV, of course, is uh, they're, they're making an app. They use it on your smartphone. They have an app. They've had an app for years. Fine. Okay. But the focus of the app is natural language, talking, explaining what you want, and it finds it for you. In a world where we have thousands of content uh, or thousands of channels of content at any given time, navigating it is what's killing all of us. And I think, here's what I suspect, is that when we say we hate cable... I don't even think we hate paying for cable. I, I know a lot of us do, but I let me put it this way. If this app were to allow me to navigate to where all I had to do is run my mouth off and say I wanted X, Y, or Z, and it says, here it is, bro, I think I would be happy to throw away $80 a month to continue to have cable. If I just had that ability now... Things this app doesn't do, it doesn't tell you that's available on Netflix. And it doesn't say you could get that on Hulu. Of course, it's from DirecTV. It's within a DirecTV environment. It finds a bunch of, uh, you know, this is what's up on pay-per-view this month, that kind of thing. But this is, the I, I believe, the only insider, the only established presence we've seen 
that's actually making significant uh, movements towards that experience that we want of just talk to your computer, tell it what you want, and it'll find it for you, bro. You don't have to know what channel it's on. You don't have to know, you know, any of this crap. Like, this would be huge to me, and this could legitimately keep me as a cable subscriber if it's as good as this article hinted at. Now, I'm, See, I'm betting you disagree with all this. I'm a DirecTV subscriber. <laughs> So when I read this story, it was very interesting to hear your take on this because I can't say I can't say you're wrong. You could you could totally be right. When I saw this story, I said, "Oh, they're taking the existing app and they're enabling the little microphone button on iOS so that I can just say my search query instead of typing it in, and it will still be just as crappy as it was before when I typed it in." Well, but the uh, and I will still have they to deal with stuff with the like ridiculous like way they handle on demand a direct tv which is essentially to play the show in real time to you and record it on your dvr yes okay look there's there's a bunch of things uh, but we have not we have heard about ideas like this from small operations who are just going to get crushed by the man this is the first time we're hearing the man actually try to create an experience that is compatible with our vision for the way we should consume content. But no, it's Imagine not. That's what I mean. Like, DirecTV's app right now allows me to watch certain channels live on the app already. It allows me to search and find any movie or TV show that is playing within a certain window on DirecTV, schedule it to record. It does all the things that you're getting excited about already. And so no, do okay. a lot of the TV Anywhere apps. The only yes, thing yes. they're adding here is the voice search, which says you can now dictate the, the text of the search okay. instead of having to type it. Well, according to the, in the article, they described the demo and the demo made it sound like there's much more than that. It, it's, it, it's the babysitter test. This is, this is our big worry, right? The idea that a babysitter could come in and just say, hey, yeah, whatever you want to watch on TV, just talk into this thing and explain. So, you know, the babysitter could say, uh, hey, where's the Cardinals game? And then boom, it's on. Or the people could say like, I really like Two and a Half Men. Is that on yet? Or uh, switch over to ABC. And then boom, and it and it just does it, and it picks automatically the high def feed, and you don't have to worry about all that stuff. Like this would be huge if they could get if they could get this end user experience as simple as we all imagine it. I will continue to set fire to almost a hundred dollars a month, and I will keep my cable service if somebody but, from a software perspective can solve this thing. What I'm telling you is this doesn't do any of those things. I'm almost certain, and I I I am willing to. Let's say I could totally be wrong. It may come out and, and it may be just as awesome as you're saying. And I know that the article makes it sound like that. But even then, when I read it, I'm like, well, I can type that in right now. Like, I want to watch some Tom Cruise. And, and the app right now will already show me the Tom Cruise movies. But it's just doing a keyword search. It's not actually doing any kind of semantic processing. It's not doing anything really crazy. So, it so sounds all this like is doing is saying you could take the app you use right now and not have to type. As far as I can tell, that's all it's uh, doing. And well, that's, the limitations are huge on what it is you can actually watch. Okay, it, so, it sounds to me like where we're divulging is a, uh, like to me, this is a project that I'm looking at in a vacuum uh, and I'm optimistic about. But to you, this is a direct TV project, which inherently carries some baggage that, that makes you skeptical of its delivery. Well, yeah, on, and, and actually, I think direct TV does a really good job, but there's some things on their app that I love, uh, like the ability to record uh, like like schedule a recording from the app is so much better than doing it on the web. Uh, I can use the app as a remote control and, and I can actually search for programs much easier in it. So the search is good. I just didn't see this as a big story because it's like, oh, they're adding voice search to it. A lot of apps have voice search now. And so now they're going to they're gonna have voice recognition on there too. That's kind of cool. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you go to reviews.cnet.com, just do a search for uh, DirecTV adding voice and you'll be able to find this article. Oh, and show notes as well. Yeah, and and uh, I I think, I mean, I, it's amazing to me that you and I read it so very differently because if this and is think, the way it's I think represented, you're absolutely right. It has to do with the fact that you don't use it and I do, and that correct. just totally colors our perceptions of what this might end up being. Correct. Well, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. So we got one more story in the slipstream. Yeah, just one of one more of these two small stories. Uh, Aereo <laughs> brings free over the air TV and cloud DVR to Boston May fifteenth. So we knew they said they were going to start expanding to 20 some other uh, cities. Uh, they are supposed to come to Austin for you, but this I hear Boston that first May 15th. I hear that. Yeah. Anything that rhymes with Austin is apparently their their priority.
Yes. Floston exactly. is getting it next. Uh, Troston. Yeah. Gloston and- is going to get it. It's going to be great. Groston. Shawston. Tube Topston. Coloss Tube Topston. <laughs> Actually, two really small things in Tube Tops. Tube Tops is all about the set top boxes with which you watch the things. Uh, Boxy's Cloud DVR, only available in certain markets. Uh, people have been wondering, okay, when are you going to start adding markets? Well, it's starting to look good. They say 26 cities by the end of 2013 still, but San Francisco is the next one to get it. So if you're in San Francisco, you can get into the beta of the Boxy Cloud DVR. Right on. Also, the CW bringing their app to the Xbox 360. So if you want to watch full episodes of Supernatural or Arrow uh, or old back episodes of Gossip Girl, you can now do it on your Xbox 360. I'll tell you what, man. I am surprised. The, the, the Xbox continues to grow and dominate that space, it would be amazing to me if the whole time the box that we all wanted was in our living rooms the whole time. Except you have to pay extra for it. I, 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 look, I, that is a flaw. That is a problem. And they may figure out a way to deal with it, but, but there's a lot of like about the Xbox. It's right, it's, it's right here. It's just been sitting on a shelf. <laughs> right on. You want to move on to Film Film? Yeah, let's do it. Now, this is what I know both of us are going to get very excited about. New episodes of All My Children and One Life to Live starting today, airing online at Hulu. Uh, uh, actually, I think this is adorable, and it's important because keep in mind the whole reason that soap operas existed was because they had essentially dark fiber, right, dead air that they just wanted to throw something in. And they're like, what if we just come up with some stories that are super cheap to produce? It's all just people talking about their feelings. And we put it at a time that we know the demographic says that, you know, it's it's going to be a very specific audience. In so many ways, I think soap operas are a massive market efficiency story, you know? And it's like the fact that these same demographic who used to watch, you know, their stories on, on the ABC, uh, nowadays are able to watch and stream at home on their iPads, uh, I think it's a very savvy decision for them to make and that allows them to weirdly make the stories even cheaper because if you're invested, like what does it even take? I think it's a smart way they're rolling it out. Prospect Park is the production company that's licensing this to put it out. Uh, they're, They're producing new episodes, but they're licensing the property from ABC. Hulu will get the episodes. You'll be able to watch the most recent episodes on Hulu, and then they'll go away. If you want to catch up and watch back episodes, you'll have to pay for Hulu Plus, or you can download them for I, from iTunes for $0.99 cents a piece or $10 per month. There's 20 episodes a month because they're doing 30-minute episodes Monday through Thursday. I'll tell you what, man. There's, I don't know. There's like an honesty. Like, look, man, are you in the club or not? Just give us ten bucks a month, and we'll, we'll fill a lot of hours. We'll, we'll, we'll we'll fill a lot of dishwashing with content that sort of reminds you you're not washing dishes. I think it's a canary in the coal mine because you're absolutely right that there is demand for this out there. Whether that audience is going to go watch these on Hulu is the big question. How many of them have iPads? How many of them know how to use the iPad to get the episode? How many of them have set-top boxes or smart TVs? How many know, know how to use that to get to the episodes or iTunes? Uh, I'm not saying they don't. When I ask these questions, I'm saying how many of them? Because there will be right. many of them. Well, Is it enough to make Prospect their money back? They, they say they need about 500,000 a- viewers per episode on average. That's not that much. This thing used to get 3 million every time it yeah. aired. So it's... It, it will well, tell us how far down that road to cord cutting we are, I think. Structurally, also, keep in mind that the reason these many of these viewers, and I don't want to stereotypify, although I'm about to do exactly that, many of these viewers just want to make the dishwashing vanish and be in another place, which to folks like you and me, Tom, that's already what we do, go, services like Audible or podcasts or whatever. We want to to be engaged, you know, we, as whatever. Uh, the But... If they can fill this audience who otherwise might be, you know, they look at it and they're like, well, 10 bucks a month, that's uh, that's 30 hours of content. That's an hour every single day while I'm doing this stuff. I don't, you know, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than buying audiobooks every single time. They're like, sure, why not? I'll do that. That kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, no, that's what I think. <laughs> I'm glad we got the definitive answer on that. It'll be interesting to see how this turns out. 
<laughs> I think it is going to. I think you're you're basically yeah. I agree with you. Will they be like us and you know put the phone or the tablet next to the sink while they do the dishes, or not? They may. That's, Many of them will. It's just a matter of how many. Yeah, it'll Eve be interesting. Online is coming to your TV screen. Uh, developer CCP Games has announced a partnership with an Icelandic filmmaker named Baltasar Kormakur. Actually, one of the more pronounceable Icelandic names I've ever encountered. His production company is going to develop a series with an original concept and storyline set in the Eve universe and based on, in part on in-game stories submitted by players of the game. This is is an awesome story because on the surface of it, it sounds utterly ridiculous. Like this is, and keep in mind, even in the pantheon of MMOs, EVE Online has like an inherently uh, it, 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 a bad visuals to go with everything. All you see is just ships moving, right? And you see as occasionally missiles flying around. Like what do you do with that and turn it into a human drama that people actually care about? But if you've been following the story of EVE Online, it is one of the most amazing uh, economies. It's one of the most amazing economic experiments in my lifetime. The way that um, that real life Ponzi schemes have come about in Eve Online, there, there's because it's a game. There are things that would be illegal to do in real life. Betrayal is part of the game. The fact that you can break alliances and, and break contracts and turn around and screw other people. The uh, the, the fact that um, that these people built a Ponzi scheme. They're full on from the beginning, like, hey, let's do a Ponzi scheme and see how far we could take it. They got like, like I, I'm going to make up a number here, like 15% of the entire EVE economy. And then we're like, and we're done. Thank you for all the money. We hope you enjoyed this part of the game, the part where you get screwed by being part of a, of a Ponzi scheme. Uh, I think there's enough stories, real life stories, to make this a very compelling show. And this is probably going to be live action. I, I'm just rereading the press release and it doesn't, actually explicitly say so but this director works with denzel washington and mark Wahlberg, uh oh, and, and yeah. wins awards this is not going to be machinima this is this no. is going to be real tv yes well and, and think about it there's no reason oh, for, and i just I mean, insulted machinima and i don't mean to i love machinima no, i don't no, love no, all the but, but as, as a genre what, what you're saying is is I, as a genre it's action. not going to be That's video like, captured yes real people yes correct well and keep in mind like there's there's nothing as far as I can tell that's inherently better about the Battlestar Galactica universe over the Eve Online universe. If what you have is compelling stories, good acting, awesome direction, then then why not? Why not? What if five years from now we're talking on on frame rate about how freaking amazing Eve Online the show is? Yeah. No. It. it yeah. No. Exactly. Again, I don't know why I keep saying that, but it is in fact possible that it becomes a hit show yeah let's uh talk about kevin spacey showing up as his character from house of cards at the washington correspondence dinner it's a funny little video they played it at the correspondence dinner if you're not familiar the correspondence dinner is kind of a roast for washington dc the president tells jokes uh, a lot of reporters come up and tell jokes. Politicians tell jokes. And it's always hosted by a comedian, Stephen Colbert, famously hosted it in a way that I don't think was as welcomed by the Bush administration as maybe <laughs> Colbert had hoped. Uh, this year it was Conan O'Brien as the host. But I, I thought it was interesting that Washington really embraced House of Cards. And it was Kevin Spacey appearing as his character alongside real politicians from Washington. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? First of all, think about the type of people who go to Washington, D.C., and think about the type of personalities and how egocentric they are and how much they love to believe that what they're doing is shaping the world. And then think about a show like House of Cards, where they all love to believe their, their uh, Frank, whatever his name is. Frank uh, Underwood. Yeah, Frank Underwood. Like, this thing's tailor-made for them. It's a giant ego stroke. I'm surprised they all didn't just scream with joygasms the moment they saw it. <laughs> I think they kind of did. They kind of did, dude. Uh, but but having said that, I only watched, I only watched like the first two minutes of it. Here, let's let's listen to a little bit of it right here. At our table, she keeps trying to friend me on Facebook. Congressman, we don't focus on the masses. We focus exclusively on an elite audience. That said, we'd like Kim Kardashian at our table. And then I need Mike to start wearing pants to the White House briefings. I refuse to wear pants until the president gives us more access. Just do as I say, and political gets a Kardashian. Oh, and Mike, what is your home address? Uh, why do you ask? 
Well, to send you the tickets, of course. Send him to the office. Nobody knows where he lives, Congressman. We mail his paychecks to a P.O. box. Oh, Mike, there's no reason to be nervous. What's your home address? It's so funny to watch this kind of thing. Like, this is, uh, first of all, uh, Kevin Spacey's awesome. And, you know, it's adorable that they did this. And the the White House press correspondence is a big enough deal that it makes sense they would participate. But didn't this feel just a little bit to you, Tom, like one of those adorably awkward corporate training videos where they get, you know, like a a C-list celebrity to reprise his No, 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 no. (laughs) not even training videos. It's the holiday video. Yes. Where they they get the CEO... And uh, and the VPs to act out some weird Christmas story that takes place in the office. And Ryan Seacrest is a guest because he used to work there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, I'm glad we're on the same page with this. It was it was also like true uh, story. The biggest the biggest thing is how long it was. Like in an age of like I mean this is like five and a half minutes. I'm just like God, take forever. But I'm yeah. sure live it played well. I, I th- well, yeah, and it's full of in-jokes, right? The political thing is probably hilarious to the guys there, and we're like, oh, I guess I kind of get that. That's sort of funny. Correct. Um, last month, Veronica Mars. This month, we have Zach Braff taking the Kickstarter to fund a movie, which he says he could probably get done without Kickstarter, but he wouldn't be able to retain creative control. So what he wants to do is give a lot of really cool rewards, including private screenings, question and answer sessions with the fans, in order to raise enough money to be able to retain creative control. A lot of people are upset about this trend. They were upset with Veronica Mars, and this makes them even more upset. What do you think, Brian? Well, first of all, I think that I could really see both sides here. So the first of all, the, the nasty side is, wait a minute, you're already some highfalutin Hollywood millionaire. And instead of getting these producers whose job it is to speculate about what will be a hit in the market and getting them to speculate and give you millions of dollars to make your movie, you want the zero risk crowd out there to give you literally millions of dollars in order to make your movie that may or may not be total crap and there's nothing we can say or do about it. And we just have to trust you and your brand. Uh, and we're supposed to be okay with that. So I, I get that. I get that. And as Zach Braff says to those guys, you guys weren't the audience anyway. You're not the target demo regardless. Uh, on the flip side, I think Zach did a tremendous job of very honestly talking to the audience, saying, here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the, here's the way Hollywood works, is you have an idea, the money people come in, and then they... They all want to throw in their own stupid goddamn 20 cents on it. And then before you know it, you got all these changes that you're not comfortable with and you get a compromised piece of trash that you no longer feel emotionally invested in. But good luck. That's Hollywood. Sorry, bro. He, what he's pitching is, do you trust me? Do you want to see my vision? Because we could do this Hollywood style and it won't happen. And, and it's very clear. He's not banking this cash. He says, I have a vision for a piece of art that I would like to make, it is imp- it is highly unlikely that in the traditional Hollywood structure, it will actually get made the way I want. So I am presenting you with a choice. Would you like to throw some bucks to me? We got some sweet rewards, got some early previews, blah, 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 name in the credits, whatever. I, I don't know what he did, but whatever the benefits are, uh, and in exchange, you will get what's what's in here in my heart. Uh, and, uh, and the audience responded. And I'm kind of... Totally down for it. It's a voluntary exchange. And it wasn't even like he was jerky about how he presented it. There was no duplicity. It was straight up like like he wasn't saying, you know, it'll be the ruination of my career unless you do this to save things. He's saying, I have something that I think belongs on the screen. I'm I'm skeptical for all the, for given my last 10 years in Hollywood, I'm skeptical that it'll come out the way I envision it. If you would like to directly support it, we can make this true artistic uh, vision happen. And I think it's beautiful and awesome that uh, that he did it this way. Brian, have you ever used Kickstarter? I have. No, I, I, have, I have spent money. I've given money to Kickstarter. But you haven't funded anything with Kickstarter. Uh, no, I, I mean, I only did one project that was on Indiegogo. I've used Why? Kickstarter for two projects. Ken from Chicago thought it would uh, corrupt my ethics if I didn't disclose that. So I'm disclosing that. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, look, I've also I think, watched I, things on CW. Um, I've I've I'll, subscribed to Netflix. Netflix I'll used tell to you be what. a subscribe uh, advertising. I mean, I mean, it, certainly, 
certainly in the back of my mind is wondering if I, someday I'll have an artistic vision that that I think Kickstarter would be ripe for. And certainly you and I are content creators, which puts us in a different perspective from content consumers. And for that, we can disclose that as well. But uh, but I mean, it's 100 percent voluntary. In fact, if you have a problem with Zach Braff's uh, thing, why don't you send us an email to fr at twit.tv and explain your case? Because I don't understand it. Brian, have you ever made money off of a summer movie draft? <sighs> Not enough. Let's check in on the summer movie draft. It is time to count the winnings. Brian Brushwood leading the way two weeks in. To- <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what's great. Way. And in this fact, is you're going to be way on top after this week because Iron Man 3 is coming out. Well, okay, so here's the thing. Number one, it's awesome to be the guy to buy all the early movies because for some brief moment, you're guaranteed to enjoy your moment in the sun of being number one, even though everyone's going to mock you the whole time. Number two, very disappointed in what a giant, big, fat dump Oblivion took for as good as the early buzz was. The fact that it's at 65 million right now, that thing's going to trickle for another week. I'll probably end up at 75, maybe 80 if I'm lucky, which is not enough for the $14 I paid for it. Number three, and I mean three with a bullet, is an Iron Man three Buzz on Iron Man is at an all-time high. This is my make or break. Or even two weeks into this thing, I'm going to know whether or not I make it. If if Iron Man surpasses all expectations, if it cracks over 400 million, I got a chance and I could stay in this thing. Outside of that, I'm screwed. Oh, I don't think you need 400 million. I want 400 million. I think, I think I not- 350 would do you just fine. Well, no, 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 it wouldn't because 350 plus the 60 million I made would mean that I spent uh 60 uh, like 64 of my hundred dollars and i would only have a half million to, or half billion to show for it uh, oh, i thought you had better that, i thought you had at least one other good movie I, <laughs> no i, mean, I don't I mean, money making wise <laughs> yes yes well but okay in general the winners tend to make like 800 900 million close to a billion and uh and in order for me to get there uh Oblivion was, I thought, one of my better bets, but it underperformed. So Iron Man has to overperform or, you know, we have to have some crazy dark horse, like like Grown Ups 2 Fever has to strike America. Otherwise, I'm screwed. Time for what we're watching. That's what we're watching. watching. Oh, you watched Rango? I finally did. It has sat there on my Netflix queue mocking me and despite the fact that john tilton my assistant told me it was a good movie finally watched it and weirdly i mean for obvious reasons if you've seen it reminded me of everything i loved about the dark tower it was adorable like such bold artistic choices to make every character in that show hideous and brown (laughs) nothing but hideous brown characters and I totally bought into everything. I loved it. I loved it. If, if, if Rango right now is on your Netflix instant queue, whatever age you are, watch it because you'll really dig it. I uh, have been watching the, the usual Game of Thrones, Doctor Who, Mad Men. Uh, did catch up on a couple more of the Americans, and I'm still enjoying it. Uh, Arrow has slowed down quite a bit for me as it nears the end. I really wanted to pick up again. But I want to talk mostly about Hemlock Grove and Orphan Black because I had opposite reactions to them and it's interesting because they're on a different release model i had two episodes of orphan black sitting on my dvr because i was starting to to lose interest a little bit hemlock grove i got really excited the first two episodes i watched and i can watch an episode anytime i want because the whole season's out sure i'm at episode six now and i just really suddenly don't care i was intrigued by the mystery the first couple episodes but halfway That's through the season even though i know i've got the whole season and maybe because i know i got the whole season i don't know but i just I am stalling out, and I, I don't know if I'll finish it. Orphan Black, on the other hand, I went ahead, kind of was like, well, I'll just watch one of these two and see. Halfway through that one I was watching, they flipped it all. Everything that I was starting to get tired of just suddenly got turned on its head. I'm like, oh, these writers know what they're doing. They just they just changed the entire game. I'm totally invested again. There's brand new mysteries to solve. Everything's different. But it's still the same show and the same characters. And, and, and so good job. And I immediately watched the other one that was on my DVR. Loved the hell out of that one and, and couldn't wait to watch the next one. I can't wait till next week. 
That is fantastic, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear. I mean, I'm sad to hear about the Hemlock Grove thing. Uh, it's it's tough to because structurally, it's amazing to me how much of my life and my consumption habits are directly ruled by the structure in which I live. The fact that I got kids around means like there's only a narrow window in which I can watch adult programming and not run the risk of a five year old walking into the room. Uh, so so Hem Hemlock Grove is kind of out because it's like I'm going to save that time for Game of Thrones or or for playing. I'm playing Max Payne 3 because it was on sale. Uh, and so I, I, I guess especially after you – like the only way I would have watched Hemlock Grove is if you were like, Brian, I know it's horror, but this is amazing and you need to watch it. Then I would have. But the fact that you're sort of mad on it, like that's the end of it. Yeah, if it had if it had kept up where it started, I'd be totally saying that. Which is like, you know, this isn't just hoarder. There's a nice mystery. There's a Twin Peaksy aspect to it, but all of that stuff just seems to have stalled out halfway through, and now it's just become a boring teen drama. Yeah, what a bummer. And I just don't care. Yeah. Let's, hey, uh, have you seen have you seen some of the promos real quick just to tease what we're gonna be watching? Have you seen some of the uh, the exclusive clips that have been leaked? I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna use air quotes for leaked the the PR clips that have been leaked for uh, Arrested Development. Uh, yes, I've I've seen one or two of them. Uh, but yeah, May 26th. Uh, th in fact, that th there's a there's a question about that in feedback. Is there not? Uh, oh, I don't know. Let's ju let's jump into feedback. Well, now it's time. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. In fact, Brian from Trona, California, posits that he noted. Is it him? Right? That said. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the one. Uh, I, I I'm one of the people that gamed Netflix for the oh, free. No, actually, oh no, that's up. a different one. No, 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 no. Game of Thrones I, one. Ah, uh, there we go. Go. Um. Where is it? It's not Jim. I, I, oh, you know what? I think I just responded. You didn't put that Maybe one in here. <laughs> oh, it was, a, it was a guy. I can't remember who it was, but he wrote it and he was like, hey, is Game of Thrones taking a break the weekend of Arrested Development coming out because they're afraid of Arrested Development and everybody's yeah, going to no, watch it? He points out that specifically, like, there's only one weekend where there won't be a new Game of Thrones. And that just happens to be the weekend that Arrested Development is coming out. Uh, and and I, I didn't actually check the calendar, but I'm pretty sure... That's also a three-day holiday weekend. That's Memorial Day, right? Yes, and they never have HBO series on holiday weekends like that. They always have some special event movie or something because they know that everyone's schedule gets disrupted. So they just they just usually take a week off for those <laughs> for those weeks. Sometimes I'll tell you what, they let me jump like watch it on HBO Go. Right. Before it airs on those kind of weeks, too. I'll be interested to see if they do that. No, so, Brian uh, Trumbo was saying he tried out Netflix for the free subscription and then ended up staying. Well, and, and actually, he specifically points out that uh, he was like, I'm one of those guys that game the system. And then the footnote is like, and by game the system, I mean, I subscribe for instant, but eventually decided that what I really wanted was the disk service. So I'm still on the disk service. So the answer is no, sir. That's not gaming the system. That's you being a customer who's happily paying Netflix. <laughs> You got gamed. <laughs> uh, and let's finish up with Jim. Uh, he says, I love the Frame Rate podcast. I think you guys totally rock that ish. There are two things I've noticed that Brian has been actively avoiding outright naming in an attempt to prevent spoiling upcoming events. This is in our spoiler zone, but we're not going to have any spoilers here. For those who haven't read the books, I question the logic behind this. Anyone who has a clue who Name Redacted is has already been spoiled. Anyone else wouldn't know anything about gender in specific. Therefore, the name itself cannot be a spoiler. The same can be said for the event title redacted. Calling it a noun deleted may give something away, but it would tease more than spoil, in my opinion. I hope this logic is sound and true, so it will allow Brian to speak unencumbered about these exciting events. Now, that reminded me about Jim on Twitter, who took me to task for even speculating. There was a spoiler zone earlier where I said... You know, I can't remember for sure, but I think X might be about to happen. And he's like, and then when that happened, it was ruined for me because you had already said it. And that was me not even remembering. And he was saying the fact that you said anything about it totally spoiled it. So, again, people just so, so, so sensitive to spoilers these days. Well, and, and, and that's fine. I mean, look, I mean, that's that's uh, the fact that the viewer or the reader now takes an active role in curating their own experience with a story. I think is, I, I'm okay with that. I think that's great. I think that's 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 savvy in the world in which we live, where uh, things aren't dictated from the top down about when and how you encounter your your story. Uh, I will say that in the spoiler zone, 
We call it the spoiler zone because we're going to talk about what was on the story, okay? People who enjoy the spoiler zone, like, I watched The Walking Dead this week. I want to hear what they think about it. And since we're all in the same club of people who having already experienced this, this story, this is where I belong. Uh, it is not the place where we would uh, on purpose say, well, and as we all know from the comic books, they later turn out to be space aliens and then they destroy the world. No, that would be like the spoiler spoiler zone, which we haven't created yet. So as a result, we try to play coy in talking code during the spoiler zone. Um, as, as we have with Game of Thrones, there's probably no surprise to anybody watching Game of Thrones that there's a thing coming and we're going to talk about the thing in code uh, it, it, and talk about how the event might be represented on the show. Well, but you got two sides of the story here. Jim saying, uh, "Don't, don't, don't, well, just say it because it's not. If you haven't seen it, you're not. It's not going to spoil it for you." Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, well, we, and we, we do, have, we do. I mean, we, we have did, Joey we did. here saying, "Just saying, there's a thing coming ruins it for me because then when suddenly a thing happens, I'm like, oh, well, that must be the thing they were talking about." No, that's dumb. Okay, well. Hmm. All right, now we are going to get a little spoilery here. If you ah, haven't seen, don't do it, don't do it. Know. If you haven't seen 1982's Star Trek II: The Search for or uh, uh, the Wrath of Khan, then uh, I can sympathize with this point because a friend of mine who managed a movie theater, uh, he said that when he was a teenager, he went to go see, super excited about Star Trek II, and they're like, "Oh, you're watching Star Trek II? I cried when Spock died." And it ruined the whole experience for him because every time there's a space battle, he's like, this is the part, this is the part where Spock died. And granted, he was wrong the whole time okay, through. No, you brought that up before. Every time. Yeah, every time it got to some, some de battle, it colored his experience. And it did kind of ruin it. In which case, look, man, call it the spoiler zone for a reason. So be, like, it's dangerous yeah, territory. But, but if we don't want to ruin anyone's experience. Zone and then you spoil things that weren't expected. Like, it's the Game of Thrones spoiler zone. And then we go and we spoil Doctor Who without telling people. That's, that's not true. fair. And that's what that's what Joey's saying is like, look, I'm watching the TV show. I don't mind being spoiled for the TV show because I'm caught up. But don't spoil me for things that might happen soon because I haven't read the books. And I am, I'm actually going to call out myself. Theater Monkey in the chat says, uh, keep in mind, Brian, that you were mad at your mom for spoiling, I'm using air quotes, the end of the Dark Tower simply by sending a text of how excited she was and surprised by the ending. And like just no, and, and that's legit, man. Like it really colored and dampened my experience at the end of that series. Just knowing like, you, you know, you know, the people who say these kinds of things, I'm like, well, what kind of thing would make mom this excited? And then you start to deduce and you start to interpolate and you start to figure out. And then all of a sudden, and all of a sudden you're not enjoying the story. You're, you're playing your own chess match against this other person who said a thing. So look, we'll, we will continue to do our best to talk about what's out and try to preserve what's coming. But I think it's fair to say, Tom, that, uh, you know, use at your own risk. The spoiler zone is is delicate territory, and we do our best to navigate it. That is it for frame rate. Are we having a spoiler zone afterwards? I'm down for it, man. Let's well, do it. Be a short TV slash FR if you want to find the episodes. We're live at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, live.twit.tv on Mondays. And you can always email us, fr at twit.tv. Onward into the spoiler zone, unless you don't want to be spoiled, in which case we'll see you next week. Dragons. I really love the. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it took me a second. I was like, is, is he really going there? I thought we just had a discussion about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so, Game of Thrones first, and then Doctor Who? Did not watch Doctor Who, bro. Did not watch Doctor Who. Okay, well, then let me just say, I should have said this in the regular show. I, I, didn't, re I didn't notice you didn't put Doctor Who in what we're watching, which you didn't. Uh, not my favorite episode this week. Okay, Everyone's good. Wild. Because pretty because much every like, season, there's one throwaway episode that I'm just like, nah, it didn't make any damn sense. And this is that one. Well, and that's uh, Doctor Who right now is in my family viewing queue. And my kids like saw a promo for, I think it was two weeks ago, there was a scary episode. But it's like, if it's too scary for them, they're not going to watch it. And I'm not going to watch it without them. 
And so, uh, so we haven't watched, uh, hopefully next week we'll dive back in and, uh, and get some good stuff. Yeah. This, uh, this, this one, this week, it was supposed to be the heart going into the heart of the TARDIS is like journey to the center of the TARDIS is the name of the episode, which is a spoiler, it. but, um, <laughs> I, it just didn't make any damn sense. They just, huh. they just changed. They just, it, it, they Star Trek the next generation to their way out of it. What does that mean? What, what is that the... means? Uh, you have a really good story until the last 10 minutes and then you just punt because you can't figure your way out of telling the story. Got it. It, it turns out to be a holodeck episode at the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about Game of Thrones then. All Game of Thrones. Okay, so Game of Thrones this week. Here's the weird part. And this is probably good that you mentioned the Doctor Who thing. Tell me if you got the same vibe on this, but of everything we've seen this season, this might have been the most throwaway episode but how great is it that Game of Thrones is the kind of show that even their most throwaway episode could still be so freaking good? Like, I just, I can't even put into words, like, every bit of this. Like, I am now, and I, I don't know if I've already said this on the show, I am now actively sad that I've read the books. I wish, if I could, wipe my memory of the entire books and just experience this story through, through HBO, I totally would. I don't remember anything about this episode. <laughs> well, I told you. It's a throwaway. It was nothing but... It really, it was, I mean, it, it's like now that you're telling me that, I'm exaggerating. I remember I remember things about the episode. I know that Agree takes John down to the pond and all that. Yep. But yep. you're right. There's really nothing... There's not a thing in my mind that's going like, oh, I, I got to the edge of my seat when X happened. It was all very plot advancing Yes. Uh, and I'm probably not as enthusiastic as you were. Like, I didn't think it was great. But again, I, did, I also don't remember being disappointed. I didn't get to the end of that episode and go, well, that was a waste of time. You know, there was nothing like that. It was a perfectly enjoyable 60 minutes of television. Well, and, and keep it, you know, you had the opening scene with uh, the the uh, trial by combat with uh, the Hound and the, uh, not the Lord of Light, the... Um, uh, uh, Barrist and Selmy, you had the 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 exposition of uh, talking Barrett about Dundarian. You mean? Oh yeah, Barrett Dundarian. Sorry, that's what that's what I meant. Uh, Barrist and Selmy is over in. Uh, he's the one serving right. Daenerys now. Yeah. Uh, when you had that conversation, which again was interesting backstory about about two jaded people who are out that's of their world, their this, exiles. This episode was all backstory. Yes, because you got and I was Jamie's totally okay with it. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You had that that confessional moment where Jamie talks about, uh, you know, the, it, yeah. Well, and plus, also in the books, like um, uh, for for those who don't, and I don't want to be that guy who's in the books, but I'm gonna be. Uh, in the books, the first two books are nothing but Jamie's pure evil, and then there's this awesome moment when in the third book. Uh, as each chapter is told from a different character's perspective, it says Jamie at the top of the book of chapter, and you're like, shut up, we're gonna get Jamie's perspective. This is the first time you saw that in the in the story. You know, the fact that he gave this very reasonable explanation, like, yeah, dude, I'm the Kingslayer. But, I mean, what else was I going to do? This guy loved watching people burn alive. I'm just going to sit there. Like, the fact that you could wrap your mind around, like, well, maybe I can't understand being Jamie. And then, uh, and then of course, you had the, uh, the, the twist. I'm using air quotes on that one because it wasn't much of a twist. But... You know the the laying out of the the plans and uh, okay, tell me this: Did some part of you like want to imagine that maybe just maybe things would turn okay, turn out okay for um, for Sansa, and that she would end up with the uh, the the Knight of Flowers with Sir Loras? How is that turning out okay? What no no well okay, like I got caught up. In the fantasy being spun of like, oh, don't you I see, see what you're saying. Like, I'm going to marry like, the king, maybe and then this you'll get time to marry. She will go off to High Garden, and yes. and she'll escape. Yeah, yes, like having it dangled and and very reasonably be presented yeah, yeah. right no, there. I, I wanted to believe in her for her, and then and then all of a sudden I got reminded that this is Game of Thrones I'm watching, and no, right. she's definitely going to be arranged to marry the imp. <laughs> And Tyrion, uh, just uh, Tyrion and Lady Olena Tyrell, both those characters did almost nothing, and yet totally still stole scenes. So this good, impressive. So good. It was good. It was good also to see uh, Peter Baelish, um, you know, doing his smarmy thing and uh, and seducing. Like 
Uh, I, I also tried to watch it with fresh eyes and in the, in the, forgive me again, in, in the books, it was almost, it was almost more, uh, Peter Baelish was more of a, uh, oh, I like you uh, as a person and I'm going to educate you as to how the real world works. But in the move or in the TV show, it's very much like, I'm definitely 43 years old and I would love to get inside that 15 year old. Uh, like it, it changes things and I'm enjoying seeing this different specific take on it. And honestly, I always felt like the book was just sort of ignoring that aspect because it's Baelish. You know yeah. that he's thinking that. And maybe, yeah. and maybe or Martin just didn't think it needed to be explicit, but, but you're right. Like this is more what you would expect from Baelish. Yes. Uh, well, regardless, even when it's bad, it's freaking great. Welcome to the Game of Thrones. <laughs> it is. It is a great game. We only got three episodes left, right? Oh, uh, don't remind me. I mean, uh, first of all, they are right to spl start splitting the books into multiple seasons. I think the first two seasons correspond to the books. They did a great job of telling enough of the story to move everything forward, but things are getting more and more complicated. I won't even be surprised slash mind it if like book five is split into three seasons or something ridiculous. Um, I, I don't see any way that uh, books four and five will be presented in the order that they were because book four, of course, only concerns book four and five happen concurrently and they only Cover, uh, book four is only Westeros. Uh, book five is only across the uh, uh, the Shimmering Sea. Uh, I, I don't see any way they're going to do that in the TV show, right? I mean, we're going to start seeing a blended story since we already saw that with uh, with the story of, of Reek. Uh, I, believe, I believe they said that. I believe they already said that they are going to just tell the story in chronological order. Um, I, I'm totally okay with it. I'm, I'm totally okay imagining with, that. I'm not sure. I, like, I do like the idea they that they wrong. just cut, start cutting it like – they realize, oh, crap, he still hasn't put the next book out. Okay, we're going to do half of half of the book next season. And it just keeps yeah. getting shorter until we have an entire season of Arya trying to go to the bathroom. Uh, yes. Although, I'll tell you what, it's interesting. I think Arya, now this is, this is totally outside of the story itself, and instead talking about the actors. Uh, Sansa <laughs> cannot pass for a 15-year-old anymore. She is definitely a young woman. Uh, I think Arya will be able to pass as as a kid for a lot longer, uh, just watching their their bodies develop. And whoa, there's right. something I was gonna say, but that would be a spoiler. There's another character who I think it will be irrelevant <laughs> whether or not that character looks their age for much longer. How about that? <laughs> I think that might be safe, but I don't even know anymore. It just <laughs> who knows? Oh, they're like, oh, there's a character that'll be irrelevant soon. Ah, oh, wow, just... it ruined it for me. Ah, all right, we're trying. You're just trying to be good. It's hard, people. Okay, <laughs> exactly. That is it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thank you. <laughs> did you say that is it for? Well, that's it, right? We any more spoilers? On? Yeah, no, no, we're good. Did Did right. you just accidentally say Tech News Today, or was I, that a I, bit you were doing? Purpose. Okay, good. <laughs> All of it. Done. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.